Welcome to The Last Way Podcast. My name is Michael, and I want you to live life skillfully and to experience Christianity as your living reality. So in this new series of podcasts, we're going to be gathering several gems from 2 Peter chapter 1. We're going to be focusing in on the first section that's known as Peter's Ladder, which outlines Christian growth and maturity. Now, this is very important because, in fact, no man can have a sound, healthful experience unless he practices the instructions that Christ gave through the Apostle Peter in 2 Peter chapter 1. So we'll be going through those instructions uh, to see how to practically live a life skillfully and experience Christianity as our living reality. So without any further ado, let's first begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we are so thankful, so grateful that you bless us with life and you bless us with another another opportunity to go through a series of podcasts looking at your word. Father, we ask that you may increase our faith, our knowledge, our understanding, our wisdom, so that we can live out this life that you bless us with skillfully, so that we can experience Christianity as our living reality, so that we can walk in our integrity and walk according to the purpose that you have set for us. So, Lord, as we would consider your word, we ask that you may waft away all darkness, all clouds that may be in our minds, and that you may shine your light from heaven upon our minds. This is our prayer. This is our desire. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we're looking at 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, and the beginning section, there in the beginning section, particularly in verse 5 to verse uh, 7, um, it's known as Peter's Ladder. But in today's introductory thought, uh, what I want to do is I want to look at verse 2 to verse 12 to give us a decent amount of context and to just get a general overview of what's going on here in Second Peter chapter 1 there in the beginnings. And in future podcasts, we're going to be focusing in on each round of this ladder known as Peter's ladder. So uh, I don't know if you're driving or in the gym or at home, just relaxing, but I'm going to read a verse two to verse 12. So I want you to pay very, very close attention to what's said here. It says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be made partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them and be established in the present truth. Many of the things that we're going to be considering throughout these podcasts, you know them. I know that you know them. But as a minister, I will not be negligent, but rather I'm going to be diligent in bringing all these things to your remembrance, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. All things that we need to live life skillfully and to experience Christianity as our living reality has been given to us by Christ's divine power through the knowledge of God. That's what Peter says here in the beginning. 
By his divine power, God has given to us all things that we need to live this life in a godly way. Because he's the one that's called us to glory and virtue. And then Paul, Peter speaks about the exceeding great and precious promises. And those exceeding great and precious promises that make us partakers of the divine nature are those eight rounds of Peter's ladder in verse 5 to verse 7. Those are God's promises. They're not merely God's to-do list. You have to do this. You have to do this. But in fact, they're actually promises that God has made. Promises that God will bring into fruition in your life. But now to really experience those promises, to really be immersed in this truth that God has laid out through the Apostle Peter, we have to be diligent. That was a word that came up a few times in here. And if you look back at verse 5, if you have your Bibles or if you're just listening, you remember when I, I noted, I'll read verse 5, the beginning section. It says, and besides this, giving all diligence, add certain things to your life. You have to be diligent in these things that you have to add, these eight rounds that we're going to consider. Diligence is about a daily commitment to excellence. That's diligence. As a mindset, it's one that knows that no one is responsible for this outcome but me. Diligence is focused effort that comes as a result of you envisioning a worthy goal. Intentionality produces diligence. What are you focused on? You see, the thing that you're focused on is the thing that you become, that you constantly observe, right? Um, we become like the thing that we admire. What we constantly observe, what we constantly diligently focus on, that's what we become. Well, we have to be intentional here in, in becoming and experiencing Christianity as our reality. We have to be intentional in living out our life skillfully. And what that means is that we need to be disciplined. We need to be focused in. We need to be locked in. We need to put our utmost in experiencing this. In becoming what it is that God wants us to become. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 3, the Bible says, And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men. This, this, this higher level of living, this higher experience that you're seeking, this higher experience that God determines for you to have, that's why he gave these instructions through the Apostle Peter, can only be gained through your diligent effort. Through your diligent effort effort. And we're going to see what do we need to be diligent in, in order to have this experience. So we are to diligently do something. You need to diligently do something. You need to add virtue to your faith. That's what, that's what the apostle Peter says. He says, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. But I want you to notice something. And notice, he says, add, notice that he says, add to your faith virtue. Notice that faith isn't added. It's assumed. It's something to be cultivated because God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Romans 12 and verse 3. In the book Lessons on Faith, there, uh, it's, um, it's a compilation um, of writings from A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner. And A.T. Jones makes the point in the beginning that, that, that the Bible doesn't talk about getting faith. Right? It's, it, because it's assumed. It talks about cultivating faith. It talks about the importance of cultivating faith. Because God has given to us all a measure of faith. So we are to add to our faith virtue. And then knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and charity. And as we diligently work on adding these things, God works on multiplying other things. I'm going to say that again. When we're working on addition, God's working on multiplication. As we're diligently working on adding these things, then God works on multiplying other things in our experience. Why? He does this so that we may remain consistent in that experience. So as we add, he multiplies. Now one may ask, well, what exactly does God multiply? Remember what we read in verse 2. In verse 2, it notes, grace and peace are multiplied unto us. Through the knowledge of God and Jesus, our Lord. So as we add each point that Christ gave to the Apostle Peter, then God multiplies grace and peace unto us. As we add 
those points that Christ gave to the Apostle Peter in every detail, in every department of our life. When everything that we do in our life is according to the knowledge of God, according to these points that God outlined through the Apostle Peter, then God will multiply grace and peace in all those areas of our life. If you add those points in your relationships, then God will multiply grace and peace in your relationships. If you add those points in your marriage, then God will multiply grace and peace in your marriage. If you add those points in your education, school education, etc., then God will multiply grace and peace in your education. If you add them into your career or your business or uh, to your projects or any position that you uh, have in any organization, then God will multiply grace and peace in that experience. Remember verse 10. Verse 10 says that if you're diligent in these things, you will never fall. So we are to add to our faith virtue. Well, let's consider faith. Let's do this a brief thought on, on faith. Let's just do some brief thoughts on, on each of those rounds and we'll, we'll, we'll deep dive into them in later podcasts. Faith is that first thing. Faith, um, you see, without it, you can't please God. The only way up this ladder is by faith, not the energy of your flesh, but faith. And that faith does not come by the force of nature, but from the work of divine grace. You see, when you practice the obedience of faith, then God will multiply his grace. Although faith is the act of man, yet it is the work of God. I read that from Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, he's called. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, I'll say that again. He says, although faith is the act of man, yet it is the work of God. Faith is that first round, but always know that as you're diligently seeking to grow and cultivate your faith, that faith is a gift that was given to you. In fact, in verse 1 of 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter speaks about how that faith, he obtained that faith from God. God gave it to him. And then with what God gives, we continue to build. In Hebrews 11 verse 6, that's where it says that, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently, here's that word again, diligently seek him. I read a quote from a man named Eric Fromm. He wrote a book called The Art of Loving. I haven't read that book, but I did read this quote and I said, I got to share it with my friends. It says, uh, to have faith requires courage, courage, courage. To have faith requires courage, the ability to take a risk, the readiness even to accept pain and disappointment. You see, when you exercise faith in God in these instructions that he has given for us to have a sound and healthy life, then this deranged and sick world will test us. It will test you. These principles that God has outlined are true, but as you practice them in this world, it will test you. The world will test you. But what you have to do is you have to trust that living by God's design will yield you the best life. It doesn't promise you that there will be no wind as you navigate over the sea of life, but it does promise to teach you how to set a better sail. Remember, if ye do these things, ye shall never fail. So to our faith, We need to add virtue. Now, now what is virtue? What is virtue? We just mentioned one virtue from that quote from Eric. uh, To have faith requires courage. Courage is a virtue. Courage is that virtue that strengthens you to practice all the other virtues in the face of adversity. But what is virtue? Virtue is moral excellence. And that's what God calls us to. Moral excellence. It's where the law is written in your heart. The moral law of God is written in your heart and you live, move and have your being according to those principles functioning 
in your heart and mind. Moral excellence, that's virtue. Thinking and envisioning excellent things all the time. That's being virtuous. Thinking and envisioning and living according to excellent things all the time. That's being virtuous. In fact, there's only one per person in the Bible. There's only one person in the Bible who's called virtuous. And that was Ruth. We'll consider a little bit about her when we uh, have a podcast on virtue. But to virtue, we then need to add knowledge. The next thing we want to add is knowledge. Uh, knowledge of what, though? Knowledge of what? Well, we, knowledge is essential in this experience because God doesn't want us to be uh, unintelligent Christians. He wants us to be in, intelligent, um, intellectually intelligent, mentally intelligent, emotionally intelligent as well. So we just noted IQ and there's also EQ. He also wants us to be spiritually intelligent as well. That spiritual intelligence is essential for us to actually live morally right and fulfilling lives. So this knowledge that we need is what? It's the truth. The truth about who or about what? Well, really about who? The truth about God necessarily. Because our characters can rise no higher than our conception of his. And our characters are what we need in order to navigate through this life. You see, our character is all that we have when we go through trials and when we face tough times. And so if our characters are corrupt, ruined, messed up, if we violated it over and over again, if we find it even ourselves to be untrustworthy, then we will automatically collapse when we come across a difficult situation. And so we need knowledge of the truth. And that truth that we need is the truth about God. Because the truth about God is what frees our mind. And you shall know the truth. And the truth will make you free. The truth is so relieving. And once we have a knowledge of that truth, we are relieved. And in fact, we feel like a brand new person. We feel like a brand new person when we have the knowledge of the truth that relieves the soul. Uh, in, it's in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1 where it says, And Adam knew Eve. So he had a knowledge of Eve. And, um, and then after that, a baby was born, Cain. So when Adam and Eve had the knowledge of one another, a new creature was born. And we have the knowledge of truth, the relieving truth of God in Christ, then we become a new creature. If we were once a creature that was worrying and frantic, now we are a new creature that is, um, is, is joyful, is confident, is uh, in, in God. Our confidence is of him. We're told that the knowledge of God in Christ is the knowledge that all who are saved must have. We need this knowledge. For salvation and also to experience Christianity as our reality in this life and to be able to overcome all the vicissitudes of this life. All right. So knowledge is a wonderful section that we're going to be considering. And to our knowledge, we need to add temperance. Temperance. Temperance is a very important point in the Christian experience. What is temperance? Temperance is self-control. It's another, it's another virtue, in fact. It's another one of the beautiful virtues that God would build into us. Temperance is the virtue that disciplines you to practice all the other virtues without taking them to their extreme. That's temperance. It's the virtue that, 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 that disciplines you to practice all the other virtues without taking them to their extreme. The well-known definition in the Adventist world is that it's the judicious use of that which is wholesome and abstaining that from that which is harmful and injurious. That's temperance. And we need temperance not only in diet, that's very important, but also in, um, well, emotional temperance, mental temperance. You don't want to overstudy. You don't want to overdo anything. You don't want to take anything to their extremes. Practicing temperance keeps your emotions well balanced. It keeps you from crippling fear and an enraged anger. You know, often the results of anger and fear for that matter, um, are worse than what got you there. So temperance allows you to, in a controlled and disciplined way, move through life no matter how high or how low things may be. It keeps you at a nice uh, steady eddy. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, the Bible says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, 
And I should add to that the spirit of anger. And I would respectfully include that in there just to get a holistic experience for us. God hasn't given us the spirit of fear or of anger, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. If we want a sound and healthful experience, we need a sound mind. That's self-control. That's what sound mind means there uh, in the Greek. Self-control, a, a mind that is self-possessed, a mind that is temperate in all things. So temperance will be a section where we'll spend a decent amount of time as well. And to temperance, we are to add patience. We are to add patience. I was reading an article. Someone was uh, speaking a little bit, writing a little bit about um, patience and impatience. And he noted that impatience tries to wrestle God for control. I thought that was interesting. Impatience tries to wrestle God for control. We've said in very uh, old uh, videos in the past um, where we were, um, we were sharing some devotional thoughts, some very short devotional thoughts. Um, this was actually the beginning of uh, when we were doing ministry in the beginning, making videos on YouTube. It's one of the devotional thoughts where we, we noted that patience is divine timing and that it remains true today, that patience is divine timing. And if you don't have divine timing, you just won't fit in heaven. You just won't fit in heaven. I read that no impatient man or woman will ever enter into the courts of heaven. So if there's something serious that we need in our experience, it is patience. In fact, in Revelation in chapter 14 and verse 12, there it says, here are the patience of the saints. Here's the patience of the saints. These saints are described as being patience. They are enduring saints. That's how they're described. So without that, um, no heaven for me, nor any heaven for you. So patience is an essential quality of the Christian, especially the Christian living in these last days. Because in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12, that, that's the summary of the people that are prepared for the second coming of Jesus. Because when you read just a few verses later, Jesus Christ returns. The intention is for Jesus Christ to return. So we need to be patient saints. So patience is also a virtue, the virtue that we need in our experience as we live life skillfully and as we become Christians in our hearts. And to patience, we are to add godliness. Godliness is, uh, well, it's the beauty of religion. It's influential devotion to God and his ways. It's inspiring others. It has a drawing power of godliness. And that drawing power is the result of the person um, being so devoted to God and all of God's ways. That's, that's godliness. Devotion to God. Devotion to being as he is. Studying his ways to be even as he is. Godliness. It's very inspiring. You know, you want to be able to walk into a room and people are inspired by your presence. And your presence is the result of you being present with God and he being present with you. Godliness. It's a beautiful thing. It's, it's inspiring. It's uplifting. It's ennobling. It's refining to not only your character, but to the, to the characters that are around you. Godliness. And to godliness, we are to add brotherly kindness. And, 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 and the Apostle Peter was certainly inspired to include brotherly kindness because what can happen sometimes is that one can take the, uh, a portion of the result of godliness being, uh, being influential and inspiring to others, but they may not be kind. You ever met somebody who's like electrifying and just inspiring to a crowd, but when you speak to that person one-on-one, -on -one, um, they're not so kind. And so it's, it's highlighted here, it's emboldened here. Don't just take the, the fruit of godliness, one of the fruit of godliness being um, inspiring or electrifying, charismatic in such a way where people are attracted to your presence, but, but make sure that you're kind. Brotherly kindness. This is godly activities uh, toward others because kindness is love in action. Kindness is love in action. And so brotherly kindness is to be in our hearts. And, and one of the big questions is, how are, how, how are you kind to the unkind? How do you practice brotherly kindness to, to a Cain? Because, because Cain, 
he wanted to kill his brother and after that he did it. So how do you practice? If, if you're able, uh, not capable, but able as in the, the person able who, who, who died. Um, in fact, he was the first, mar he was the first person that died and he was the first martyr human being that is, um, how, if you are able, then how do you practice brotherly kindness toward Cain? Something that we want to kind of go through. Uh, but then to brotherly kindness, the last round, to brotherly kindness, add charity. That's the top. At the Philadelphian love, it is charity. That is Christian love, altruistic love, meaning all for the other, none for self. Um, agape love. So much can be said about that. But to wind down and close here, I just want to read 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 to verse 11, regarding Christian love. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. Love has no residence outside of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we are also to love one another. If we live this way, we will never feel empty. We will never feel useless. We will never feel without purpose. If we live this way, we will never fall. But we will stand. We would be living life skillfully and experiencing Christianity as our living reality. And heaven would be brought nearer to us as we're on our way there. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for these gems. We thank you so much for these uh, rays of light that you've shown our way. And God, we would continue to diligently go through each round of Peter's ladder as Christ has instructed so that we can have a sound and healthy experience in this world in preparation for the world to come bless us father we pray cleanse us of all of our sins in jesus name we pray amen